I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah. All right, thank you. I'm Al McFarland. I'm the host of Conversations with Al McFarland. I'm editor and chief of Insight News. My thanks to all of you for being here. My thanks for our host organization, this great church, New Salem Missionary Baptist Church, to bring you greetings and to set the tone for this important engagement. Please welcome Reverend Jerry McAfee. Amen. We greet you in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, and from the brothers and sisters on the block, what's up? Uh, let me say to you all, first of all, uh, to give Pastor Heron a hand, because this was moving fast, and he <laughs> took the leadership. I am uh, currently the president of the Minnesota State Baptist Convention, and we represent about 38 churches. See Pastor Russell out there from Friendship, who will be succeeding me next year. What we've tried to do, yeah, give him a hand. Man. And this is for you as well as the candidates to know that we represent quite a few people on any Sunday morning if you come here. Uh, Brett was here this morning. This church is packed from cover to cover, and over 65 percent of those people are from Minneapolis. Uh, what we try to do is each Sunday allow candidates that call two to three minutes to at least introduce themselves so they'll know. I also uh, friends and partners with His Works United, which is collectively it's about a hundred churches. Bishop Howell, Bishop Washington, Ronnie Patterson from uh, St. Paul. And I would suggest that somewhere along the line, y'all might want to stop by because we are organizing ourselves to move as a unit. I'm of the opinion that over the last eight years or more, it's been dire straits for the African American, especially in North Minneapolis. We are behind economically educationally, all the way down the line. And it appears to me that everybody who the DFL in particular cares about, change happens. But the group that votes 95 or more percent with the DFL, which is the African American, we're not given that much attention. And what we want you all to know that that pendulum is swinging and is changing, that if there's not progressive action to meet our needs, if you can put all that money and time into same-sex marriage, you can put the same amount of money into employment of African Americans. And so we're looking forward to the discussion. So welcome, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, pastors, for coming. We look forward to a good debate and to get the right representative for our people. God bless you. Thank you, Reverend McAfee. And again, thank you all for being here. Thank uh, the candidates for your willingness to serve our community and our country. And uh, it's important. I want to speak briefly on the role of the black press. Uh, we have an obligation to raise questions, to challenge and speak truth to power. That's our mission, and we are happy to be in partnership with the black pulpit. There's a national movement, the black press and the black pul pulpit, two legacy institutions committed to the truth committed to serving our people, and we're pleased to be doing this as a part of that national collaboration unfolding in local politics. So, so let us begin. Uh, 
We have sent questions to the candidates for the office of mayor. They have the questions, and we said that of the 10 questions, six or so will be asked for this program. We also intend to allow audience questions probably two or three people at the end of the program. We will be closing the program at or shortly after five o'clock. Our mission was three to five. We're a little bit late, but we are uh, with a good audience. We feel very good about this. We may, with your forbearance, go to about 3.15, so it's a two-hour program. Uh, the format for this first round is to ask each candidate to introduce himself or herself. Uh, he can take one minute to do the introduction, and in doing so, say why you choose to run for the office of mayor. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Gary Schiff. It has been my pleasure to be a city council member representing the neighborhoods of Phillips, Longfellow, Powderhorn, Corcoran, and Seward on the city council of Minneapolis. And I'm running for mayor because I believe that we have an opportunity to help small businesses grow and our neighborhoods grow stronger. I was raised the youngest of six kids in a faith-based family that taught me the value of education, hard work, and the importance of helping others. I have been a coalition builder on the city council and a consistent progressive voice. As mayor, I will put Minneapolis first by making sure that city residents get jobs on city projects and to make sure that we invest in early childhood education so that we can shatter the cycle of poverty that is keeping our children behind. Thank you, Gary. I want to acknowledge our timekeeper, Sandra Crump, is right here. She's got instructions at 15 seconds and one that says time. So um, panelists, please uh, listen to the, um, the, the uh, loud statement she's making when it says stop or time. That's what you have to do. Uh, Jackie? Good afternoon. Thanks for everybody being here today and thanks for hosting us today. I'm Jackie Cherry Holmes and I'm running for mayor. I'm running because I believe we can be and will be a city that works for everyone. With vibrant, engaged citizens and a can-do spirit, Minneapolis can be a city where everyone is welcome, everyone is valued, and everyone has an opportunity. I will lead our city by bringing all of our partners together, from churches, from labor, to business, to residents. Together we will build a city that ensures a bright future for our children, ensures accessible transit so we can get to each other and we can get to jobs, ensures a place, a city where everyone is housed and everyone is welcome, and a city that is unified. I lived in Minneapolis all my life. I've worked and organized in the neighborhoods of our city. I've been an elected representative. I've been an engaged citizen. I've run a business, and I've run the city's government. These skills, my experiences, and my relationships make me the best qualified person to the, be the next mayor of Minneapolis. I ask for your support. Thank you. Mark Andrew. <clears throat> you can applaud. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Andrew, and I am running for mayor because I love our city, all of our city, from south to north, from east to west. Everybody is the same. We are all Minneapolitans. I believe in the city, and as mayor, I will bring a fresh perspective as a business person for the past 14 years and as a Hennepin County Commissioner elected five times prior to that. I'm running for mayor to do three things. First, we will make this city the greenest city in North America and use it as an economic development tool to build jobs. Secondly, I care for every one of our city's children and I want to close the achievement gap and the opportunity gap to help make all of our citizens productive in the future. And finally, I want to foster an environment between the business community and the workers to create jobs, build tax base, and increase our population. Thank you. Thank you. Don Samuels. Good afternoon. I'm Don Samuels. I'm running for mayor of Minneapolis. My wife and my two daughters are here. We live about five blocks from here. We moved into the community before these little girls were born, young ladies, and uh, we're not going anywhere. 
We're here to lead from within. And uh, we're going to do it in uh, three different ways. We're going to make sure that we have strong economic development and that businesses are attracted to our community to hire and employ our young, our young people and our families. Attached to that is a very important connector, public safety. Public safety brings businesses, and businesses improves public safety. And then, of course, the children. We're going to make sure that our children are educated. Now you're going to all hear us all say great things, but I'm going to measure everything. We're going to measure the performance of our children, the engagement of our citizens, their economic development, and make sure everything works. Thank you, Don. Betsy Hodges. Thank you. For many years now, I've had an opportunity to talk to folks from all across Minneapolis about our biggest visions for ourselves, our families, and our community. And I find that overall, we pretty much all want the same thing. We want a prosperous, unified city that works. And in recent years, in some measure, we have been getting that, and I'm proud of the work I've done to make that happen. We're poised better than almost any other city in the country to take advantage of this economic, uh, uh, this economic recovery. I am running for mayor because I want everybody to benefit from the opportunities coming in Minneapolis. I am a leader who brings people together, who can unite Minneapolis behind a strong progressive agenda that creates jobs, make sure our kids are thriving, make sure our neighborhoods stay safe, and makes Minneapolis the greatest city of the 21st century. Thank you, Betsy. Cam Winton. Good afternoon. My name is Cam Winton. I'm a husband and a father and a business leader in the renewable energy business. I'm running for mayor because I too love our city and I want to build on all the things that are great about it, but I also want to bring a fresh set of eyes to the challenges we face. I'm not seeking the endorsement of any party and I'm not coming to this race with a background in government. The other candidates on the stage here with me are good folks who have worked hard but between them, they have 54 years in government. And so today, as we hear the different policy ideas that folks are sharing, I'd ask you to think to yourselves, they've had 54 years. Why hasn't that happened yet? In contrast, I bring a fresh set of eyes. My coworkers and I built a wind turbine maintenance company, 120 employees. I know a thing or two about job creation. And I want to draw on that background to provide the essential city services effectively, to enable others to build jobs the way I have, and close the opportunity gap by putting children first in our schools. I'm Cam Winton, and I'd welcome your interest. Thank you. Thank you. And so the next round, uh, the first question, the candidates will have 90 seconds to answer, and our timekeeper will let you know when 15 seconds are up and when it's time to quit. I'm going to start on the opposite end again, this time with Cam Winton. The question is, um, what is your history of accomplishments on behalf of the black community, your history of service to the black community, and what have you done for us lately? Sure. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McFarland. And let me say again, it is an honor to be here today. We are in the house of the Lord on the Lord's Day, and so what comes to mind for me is a saying that President Kennedy first said, that when we go about seeking to make our communities better, we can ask God's blessing and we can ask God's help, but here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. That's the spirit that I have brought to my work throughout my professional life, my charitable life, my church life, and now my political life, to create opportunities for all. Some of the opportunities I've created, yes, have been for folks of color. Some have been for folks that are white. But what I have sought to do is go colorblind into that work. And let me give you two quick examples. Here in Minneapolis, when that bridge collapsed, I represented one of the individuals who was injured. I did so for free. My law firm, the law firm where I was an attorney, represented 80% of those victims for free. And I'm proud of the fact that my work on her behalf, and she's a minority, secured for her the compensation she needed 
to pay for her medical bills going forward. I'll also tell you that in the work I did, I mentioned building a wind turbine maintenance company. We make wind generated electricity cost competitive. And you may be thinking, well, why on earth does that matter here today? It matters because for every bit of wind energy that works, it means we don't have to use a coal-fired plant or a trash-burning plant that generates pollutants into our community here. I look forward to speaking with you more about what I've done for all of our communities. Follow-up question, the, the response is 30 seconds. Uh, so you mentioned you've created a company that employs 120 people. Uh, what's the ethnic racial composition of your workforce? I've never counted, Mr. McFarland. What would you guess? How many blacks work for you? Well, out of 120. Sitting here right now, I just don't know the answer to that question. But okay. I'll tell you that primarily we're drawing our labor pool from rural Minnesota, rural South Dakota, okay. and rural Iowa. So probably not as high as it would be okay. if the wind turbines were right here in Minneapolis. Okay, thank you for your, your answer. Sure. Uh, same question, the first question, uh, again, to uh, Betsy Hodges. The question is, what is your history of accomplishments uh, with and for the black community, your history of service to the black community, and what have you done for us lately? Thank you. I, um, unifying Minneapolis is one of the reasons I'm running for mayor, and it's one of the reasons that I got into public life in the first place. And in my seven years on the city council, I have fought hard for the Civil Rights Department. I, have fought, I was on the work group to reform the CRA. I have made sure there were dollars, extra dollars put into the contract compliance unit. And I fought hard for the complaint investigations unit to have good results. I've done a great deal of work on police accountability, knowing that the relationship to the community is important if we are going to actually be safe, because folks need to be able to call the police and know that they will be safe when the police come. And so I've spent time working with the CRA. I have spent time in the department. And when Chief Dolan was first being appointed with a couple other council members, put together an entire list of expectations that we used as performance measures that had to do with the culture inside the department and had to do with community relations. I fought hard for transportation for communities of color, most recently assuring that uh, we were working with the county and the Met Council uh, for the Botano line uh, and for a streetcar to connect Broadway to that Botano line so that we can have good economic development in the parts of town that need it most. I supported the equity plan that the city put together. And most recently, I have told people very openly that I do not support increased burning at the HERC, in part because those extra uh, particle emissions would be going over some of our hardest hit communities. Follow-up question, thank you for the answer. And so uh, is there one defining act that our community can identify with you that has served the black community? I would say it's my consistent work over time to fight hard for the Civil Rights Department and the work that they do. Uh, the CRA work group, I didn't support the most recent police oversight review because I don't think that it goes far enough in assuring there's a firewall between the department and between um, the civilian oversight. Uh, the work I've done with the contract compliance unit and mo most recently with the stadium, working hard to make sure minority-owned businesses are being treated fairly and encouraged in the work that they do. Thank you. Don Samuels, the same question to you. What is your history of accomplishments for the black community and service to the black community? What have you done for us lately? Yeah, well, you know, I moved from Jamaica in 1970, went to college for four years, graduated and immediately moved into the African-American community because I had been hankering after doing that, even sitting in my backyard in Jamaica. I wanted to be part of the civil rights movement. That's why immediately after I started working, I joined Ebenezer Baptist Church in Providence, Rhode Island, and began to teach young people in Sunday school and help run the children's program. I did that in churches all across the United States for 25 years. And every time I was involved, I didn't want to be a deacon, I didn't want to be a trustee, I just wanted to help the children. Then uh, after that, I decided to, uh, to branch out a little bit into the community. 
And so I started to tutor. I joined the 100 African American men in their tutoring in St. Paul. Three hours every Saturday morning for three years, I co-founded that tutoring program for 175 ninth graders. And then um, I, was, I joined the St. Paul School Board Curriculum Committee to bring the interests of our African American kids to the fore. I have a 36-year-old African-American son. I raised him in the inner city all across America, always living in the inner city, always tutoring his friends, always taking care of my community. Then I moved into Jordan with my wife and raised our children. We started having vigils for young African-American men that were killed and were ignored by the press and others. And once coming into office, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Well, the follow-up, you can continue with the follow-up. I mean, is there a signature item that you think defines uh, Don Samuel's engagement of service to the black community? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I'm very proud of is that I, with Councilmember Glidden, brought forward a resolution to ban the box, meaning that you cannot use a person's criminal history before you consider whether or not they qualify for a job. Okay. Thank you. We can't waste our young people's lives. We must educate them early, educate them well. If they fail and fall aside, we must restore them immediately and fully with all of their rights and privileges as citizens. And that means academically, that means politically, and that means uh, occupationally. Thank you, Don Samuels. Mark Andrew, same question. Uh, what is your history of accomplishments for the black community, of service to the black community? What have you done for us lately? My earliest recollection of doing something in service for the black community happened way back, way back. I was 15 years old, and my friend and I biked across the city to come to Plymouth Avenue in the aftermath of the police riots of 1965. And we stood, I didn't know what it all meant. I just knew it was wrong. And I knew it was reprehensible. And we stood in common cause with African Americans in North Minneapolis to help our community rise up against that kind of treatment. Later in life, after I was elected, I was the, one of the people who recruited my dear friend Sharon Sales Belton to run for the city council as the first African American council member and was deeply involved in recruiting her to run for mayor thereafter. When I was on the county board, I authored and was the chief author of the divestment uh, portfolio resolution at the county board making Hennepin County one of the first urban counties in America to rise up against the appalling conduct of apartheid in South Africa. As county commissioner, I quadrupled funding for childcare so that African American families can get to work and not have to leave their children home alone. I stood up with the Council on Crime and Justice and paid for the study that uh, studied um, county study of African American prison policies and how we can correct that. I was a strong supporter of Step Up. I pumped millions of dollars into Pilot City, now, Mar uh, now North Point. And finally, I was the author of the county board resolution to go after the problem of lead in paint and in the community, which is wrecking such havoc with black children throughout our city. Is there, is there a signature event, one that you would bookmark as a defining of your contribution, of your service to the black community? Of all of the issues I've listed, I think the thing that I'm the most proud of wasn't a local issue. It was a global issue that required our action to act locally, and that was the divestiture policy. It was very, very controversial. It got national uh, uh, recognition in the news media, and it was very hard to pass, and it was the right thing to do because even though it didn't affect our Minneapolis people directly, it was a major moral statement that we had an obligation to stand up to and speak and shout from the rooftops. Thank you. Jackie Cherry Holmes, same question. What is your history of accomplishment for or in the black community on behalf of the black community and service to the black community? What have you done for us lately? Well, my first involvement was when I was 14 years old. 
have you beat by one year. And I worked uh, on Earl Craig, the late Earl Craig's campaign, first, uh, for first African American to run for a high political office in Minneapolis. But it really began when I moved to North Minneapolis oh, about 33 years ago. And when I moved to North Minneapolis, I made a commitment that I wasn't going to live in the community, I was going to be part of the community. I was a community organizer. I worked with uh, minority-owned small businesses. I produ produced housing for primarily women and children from the African-American community. I then went to the city council where I was uh, the leader that led the disparity study. We have the first, had the first disparity study that sets the standard for our women and minority-owned business uh, goals in Minneapolis. I helped create the civil right or the uh, civilian review authority, which I will support again uh, when I become the mayor, because I think it's important and I think the new system doesn't work. Um, I led by example, hiring African American people in my office every opportunity that I had, and um, nurturing them so they went on and did even bigger and better things later on. After leaving public service, I didn't leave the community. I continued to live here in my home in North Minneapolis, and I've continued to serve. Uh, I've worked with Phyllis Wheatley in building their award-winning daycare center. I've worked with Summit Academy and the Network for Better Futures on creating job opportunities. Um, I've continued to be uh, influential in my community. I still work with my block club. So uh, my service goes over the course of about 35 years, and I'm proud of my service to the community. Uh, the follow-up question is a little bit different. Uh, so what are the unique challenges that you've experienced in engaging and connecting and serving the African or black community? The unique challenges are, I think, you have to be engaged in many, many different ways. You have to be engaged through the church community. You have to be engaged through the service community. You have to be engaged through the nonprofit community. It has to be intentional engagement, it has to be authentic engagement, and it has to lead to real results. Thank you. Uh, Gary Schiff, uh, the same question. What is your history of accomplishment for the black community and service to the black community? What have you done for us lately? In 1997, I was a grassroots organizer working with the Urban League and with Outfront Minnesota, trying to build a coalition that would close loopholes in local civil rights laws. I was 25, but I knew it was wrong that you couldn't file a complaint against the police department in Minneapolis under local civil rights laws. And when the council at that time refused to close that loophole, we took it to the people. I proposed a charter amendment that went on the ballot that was passed overwhelmingly with over 60% of support, and the Civil Rights Charter Amendment of 1997 was passed by the voters, making it possible to file a complaint locally in the Civil Rights Department when people believe that the police department violated civil rights. And my history has been as a community organizer, working in coalition, whether that's with AME St. James Church in my district, the oldest, AME Church in the city of Minneapolis, working to change the name of the street, Dite Alley, that is behind that church that's named after a neo-Nazi doctor, or whether or not we are working to uh, build new opportunities for daycare, for early head start, for early childhood investment, for prenatal programs. That is the work that I'm most proud of. It's the work we do together. It's the work we do in coalition. Follow-up question, uh, is there a signature activity, signature project that you think reflects, reveals your uh, attitude, your style, your engagement with the black community? It may have been the mediation, being an early supporter for federal mediation between the community and the police. I fought for this hard in my first term on the city council and eventually happened after coming together and People like Al Flowers were part of a community police relations panel that has come together. We're not there yet. We have a lot of work we need to do, but I'm very proud of my vote to not lay off the civil rights investigators in the Civil Rights Department so we could preserve our legacy of civil rights protection here in Minneapolis. Thank you. Everybody here okay? Sound is good? Okay, great, thank you. Next question, uh, we'll start with you, Gary Schiff. What are your strategies for business and economic development that maximize black participation? Have you supported black contractor inclusion in city construction projects? And have you supported full enforcement on contract compliance laws? 
Absolutely. I support full inclusion in the workplace, and I believe we need to get to the next generation of accountability and the next generation of making sure that we're showing results. When Children's Hospital wanted city financing to expand their campus on Chicago Avenue in my ward, I held the city financing up until Children's Hospital signed an agreement agreeing to give jobs to people who live in the zip codes near the hospital. And in the same way, I will demand as mayor accountability for the private companies that get contracts with the city of Minneapolis. We can require that people hire from our city job training programs so that we have fuller opportunity, fuller employment in our communities. And we need to not just ban the box for municipal jobs, but we need to push that the contractors who get city tax dollars also ban the box when they agree to get money from city taxpayers. We need to make sure that we are using zip code hiring with city projects. I had the sidewalk in front of my house replaced last year. A company from Lesur, Minnesota got the contract. Do we have people in our community who can fix a sidewalk? Absolutely. We should be keeping the jobs local, keeping the investment local, and make sure when we sign contracts, we are investing in the people who live in our neighborhoods. And as mayor, I will take the next step to make sure zip code hiring becomes a way that we do business in the city of Minneapolis. Thank you. Jack, Jackie Cherry Holmes, what are your strategies for business and economic development that maximize black participation? Have you supported black contractor inclusion in city construction projects? And have you supported full enforcement on contract compliance laws? Let's take the last part first. Yes, I have, an, I have supported uh, contract compliance, and I have been supported full inclusion, and will continue to do so. Not only have I supported it, but I've led on it. I have gone out, I've, uh, as I said earlier, instituted the disparity study that led to the uh, strong hiring goals that we had in Minneapolis that are even stronger now. Um, the problem that black businesses face is they lack support, capital, and opportunity and we need to address all three of those things in order for folks to be successful. We need to, uh, I have a long history of working with black businesses. I wrote the first uh, business plan for Seed Academy over 30 some years ago, um, and I chair the West Broadway Coalition where we work with uh, African American owned businesses, and I am on the Governor's Urban Initiatives Board, another opportunity to bring opportunity to businesses in our community. We need to provide the support to organizations like NEON and MEDA to ensure that they can continue to work with our businesses. We need to provide leadership with our lending institutions, uh, uh, both our local lending institutions and uh, institutions such as the Federal Reserve Community Board to ensure that people have access to financing and are able to start and, and uh, run their business. And we need to refocus our CPRED priorities within the city of Minneapolis to ensure that small businesses are a focus of our effort and that small business Businesses have the uh, opportunities available to them that they need. Um, I have always supported black inclusion on uh, city construction projects, and in fact, I can remember sitting in my office uh, when uh, Target wanted to build downtown and they didn't have an affirmative action plan. And I said, well, there's just no way that anything's getting signed till you sign your affirmative action plan. I have a record of leadership on this in this area. Thank you. Mark Andrew, same question. What are your strategies for business and economic development that maximize black participation? Have you supported black contractor inclusion in city, uh, in your case, I suppose, county construction projects? And have you supported full enforcement on contract compliance law? Thank you. For 16 years, I served on the Hennepin County Board of Commissioners, and we undertook in a very aggressive way exactly the same strategies that every person is identifying here today. I think moving forward, we want to up those numbers, both women and minority business uh, employment opportunities through contracting and all construction projects. Zip code hiring, I think, is an opportunity that we need to test, but it's been done on a very modest level so far. We need to up those standards and up our efforts in that regard. And I also want to say that all of the things that are being talked about here are things that city council members already could be doing. And there have been some efforts in this area, but we are lagging and we have not been doing enough. And by the time somebody graduates from the city council to run for mayor, they darn well better have a big vision of what we're going to accomplish. I come into this campaign with a big vision. Here's what I want to do, all of the above everything everybody has talked about. 
I will use what I did with the Midtown Greenway in Minneapolis, where we created a bike corridor on the south side of Minneapolis for $3 million and about $10 million from the cities and the parks. And today we have $500 million of economic development going on in those corridors. It's a huge economic development strategy. I'm going to take that strategy. I'm bringing it to North Minneapolis. We're going to green the north side. We're going to connect the riverfront all the way over to uh, the park on the other side. And we'll get into the other strategies around trans transit later on. Thank you. Don Samuels, what are your strategies for business and economic development that maximize black participation? Have you supported black contractor inclusion in city construction projects? And have you supported full enforcement on contract compliance laws? Absolutely, Al. Um, in fact, over the uh, last difficult years of the Great Recession, um, I made sure that the lion's share of uh, the federal dollars that came into Minneapolis came to North Minneapolis, where our uh, contractors, especially African American, were uh, feeling the biggest brunt of the economic burden. Over 80% of those funds came to North Minneapolis, and 85% of those contractors were African American contractors from our community. That has never happened before. And uh, we've now upped our expectation that 32% of all uh, contracts that the city is involved in must be done by minority contractors. And I used my pen and wrote when I saw that the, the stadium was going to be built. I said, we want to be involved as a city so that we can make sure that our minority workers and contractors are included. And I put in 32% on that contract as it was passed by the state with my hand. <laughs> so I'm very serious about this. And now we're not going to just sign things. We're not going to put words on the paper. We are going to measure everything. We're going to monitor everything. And we're going to make sure those things are accomplished. Thank you. Betsy Hodges, what are your strategies for business and economic, economic development that maximize black participation? Have you supported black contractor inclusion in city construction projects? And have you supported full enforcement of contract compliance laws? Contract inclusion, contract compliance, and making sure jobs go where jobs are needed most are crucial to the future of the entire city. So as mayor, I will make sure jobs go where jobs are needed most and that we are creating incentives where jobs are needed most. Right now, I know that the Minnesota Chamber is working with uh, philanthropy to create an incentive program to put jobs in the most distressed areas in the city. We need to be on board with that, and we need to be a full partner with that. We also need to make sure that our transit and transportation is going in the communities that need it most, because those not only allow people to get to jobs, they bring jobs to people. And that is going to be a crucial strategy for making sure our entire city thrives moving forward. And I have been a strong advocate for contract, uh, for contract compliance and making sure minority-owned businesses and folks are included in the projects. I'm the only opponent of the stadium who's on the Stadium Implementation Committee. And from that seat, I have been able to insist and make sure that not only are the jobs building building the stadium, but the jobs that go in the stadium afterward will make sure that we meet our minority hiring goals. I'm also, at the moment, working to create some incentives to have that go into the entire stadium district. And I also made sure, in the last two years, that we had extra money in the budget going to our contract compliance unit to make sure we could do the work and do it well. Thank you. Cam Winton, uh, what are your strategies for business and economic development that will maximize black participation? Have you supported black contractor inclusion in city construction projects? Do you support full enforcement of contract compliance laws? Absolutely. You know, I'm an attorney, and everybody hates attorneys until they need one. But when I look at the question of supporting enforcement of, of contract compliance laws, yes, absolutely. You know, it was a long, hard struggle, a lot of it conducted before I was even born, to get to a place where it's illegal to discriminate against someone because of the color of their skin. We've worked long and hard as a society to have those laws in place, and absolutely, yes, 
I would enforce them. Let me talk in particular about three aspects of, of what I'm saying here. Ban the box. Is there anybody who's not familiar with ban the box? What a great idea. You know, we should never judge someone by the worst thing they ever did. And what ban the box enables us to do is take the whole person, take the measure of that whole person, not get hung up on a crime they may have committed previously. And I absolutely, excuse me, support ban the box and would make sure that we continue to use it as widely as possible in hiring decisions. Secondly, the step up program. That is an active city program that has provided thousands of our community's youth with experiences in businesses to learn the soft skills of having a job. And the majority of those thousands of participants have been minority children, minority young adults. And I would make sure that we not just maintain the Step Up program, but expand the use of the Step Up program. The final thing I want to mention is purchasing overall. And we've talked a lot about the importance of including people from all walks of life and all backgrounds on construction projects when we're building things. As mayor, I'd like to look more at the $1.2 billion that the city spends in its budget each year to make sure that we're using that $1.2 billion to create economic benefits as widely as possible in our community. Thank you. The next question uh, sort of follows this one. I'll talk about, uh, ask you to talk about unemployment, jobs, job and workforce issues. Uh, and we'll start with you, uh, Cam. This is a 90-second response, uh, and our timekeeper will remind you when your time is almost up. How would you use city resources to address black unemployment and the elimination of poverty? Sadly, uh, this was reported recently in Minneapolis, a white man coming out of prison is more likely to be hired than a black man coming out of college. Black unemployment is 22%, it's the highest in the nation, while 5% for whites is the lowest. How do you fix this problem? Thank you for the question. And this is one where I would ask folks to remember the thing I said when I started. With all respect to my opponents, who are good folks who've worked hard, they have 54 years of government between them. And I'm coming with a fresh set of eyes, looking at the problem of the lack of employment and the lack of opportunities. As mayor, I'd do a few key things. The first is to make it easier for people to start businesses in our community and expand them so that we have the jobs we need. Right now, it is too cumbersome for someone who wants to start a business in our city to do so. They have to go downtown to get essentially a permission slip to expand a corner store, to start a restaurant. When I'm mayor, no more. The person will be able to do that either online if they have access or via the telephone if they don't. They'll be able to get the permissions they need more quickly than they get them right now. Right now, it can take months to get, excuse me, the necessary permits. And when I'm mayor, I'm going to say, the city has three weeks to weigh in. And if the city hasn't weighed in within three weeks, then the city's lost its chance, and that project gets to proceed. This is a dramatic change, and I recognize that, but we need this type of dramatic change if we're going to see the job growth that we need to see. Another thing I'd make sure is that the city is budgeting responsibly and only spending money on those things that we really need to be spending money on because when we don't budget responsibly, when we spend more money than we should, who gets the bill? It's citizens that can't afford it and it's job creators that can't afford it and go elsewhere to start jobs that we need right here. Betsy Hodges, how would you use city resources to address black unemployment and the elimination of poverty? Confronting with and dealing with this issue head on is one of the fundamental things we need to do to become the city we choose to be and the city that we think we are. I would make sure that jobs go where jobs are needed, as I said in the prior question. I would work with the city to stabilize families and neighborhoods. I would work in partnership to support our education system. And I would work in partnership to help diminish and eliminate the wealth disparity in the community. Jobs going where jobs are needed means we do indeed have to support Ban the Box. Stabilizing our families and neighborhoods means we have to put money into housing and affordable housing throughout the entire city. It means we have to work on public safety and work on all the strategies for public safety that we have at our disposal to stabilize our neighborhoods. 
We need to support the education system by starting before children are born and working with them until after they graduate and working with the entire family and community to make sure that happens. And we need to deal with the wealth disparity. Not only has home ownership decreased dramatically in our communities that have been hardest hit by the foreclosure crisis, but the lack of banking and predatory lending means that even further resources are being bled from our community. And we need to advocate at the state for better predatory lending laws, and we need to work with the nonprofits like NEON and Build Wealth Minnesota who are working on these banking issues for the community. Thank you. Don Samuels, how would you use city resources to address black unemployment and the elimination of poverty? Thank you, Al. Well, we first have to start inside the city. We need to make sure that uh, we employ uh, people of color and that we reward uh, managers for doing that and that we punish them when they don't and that we have a results uh, metric system that demonstrate how managers are doing. Also, I believe that we, we need to have uh, good transportation to get people to jobs. You know, you can't get a bus on Broadway across to the Northeast. You got to go downtown and then go Northeast. We need to make our connections through the city to finish what we started with Van White and connect our people to jobs. And then we need to expand programs like Step Up. You know that Step Up employs 42% of Northsiders. Step Up program citywide, 42% Northside, even though our population is closer to 20% of the city. We're going to expand Step Up and expand the opportunities for low-income uh, kids. And then we're going to unbundle our contracts so that small contractors can get jobs because small contractors hire more, and, and, and contractors of color hire more people of color than the large contractors do. Then we've got to educate our children. It's easier to build strong boys and, and children than to fix broken men. So we've got, to, we've got to build strong young people so they are educated and equipped to take jobs and we stop having to bail them out later. It is time to fix them, build them strong, and so they can defend themselves, protect themselves, support themselves, and pay taxes later like everybody else. Mark Andrew, how would you use city resources to address black unemployment and the elimination of poverty? I appreciate the things that the current city council members have said today about what needs to be done, but a lot of these prescriptions that are being espoused today they could have been working on this for a long time. It's inexcusable to me that we don't have enough African-American people on the city payroll than we have today. We have, to, we have to incent our department managers to do more. And rather than punishing them for not hitting goals, we need to identify what kinds of internally provided job training opportunities that link the skills needed for city jobs to the available resources that are out there. And then we need to go and get the warm bodies, get them trained, and get them on the payroll. That's something that should have been happening a long time ago. As mayor, I'm going to make that happen in a big way. The other thing that I would say is that in addition to the zip code hiring and all the other things we've heard about contracting, which all of us support, I want to point out, five, you got five Democrats here and one Republican. I'll guarantee you all Democrats agree in the aggregate on most of these initiatives, most of these things. What we have to have is somebody who's got a vision, who's willing to put it together, lay it out there for the people to discuss and debate, and then be willing to take action to make it happen. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. I have five more seconds. Anybody who talks about jobs and voted against the stadium cost our community 5,000 jobs. Jackie Cherry Holmes, how would you use city resources to address black unemployment and the elimination of poverty? Well, I would argue uh, with uh, Mr. Winton that this doesn't need a fresh set of eyes. This needs someone who knows what they're doing and has done something in the past. I would also argue that, and I would agree with, with uh, my colleague, Mr. Andrews, that the folks who are sitting here who haven't done it we need to hold them accountable. The fact of the matter is, this is a personal issue for me. Many of you know that I'm married into a large, large extended family. This is about my husband. 
This is about him with a, a law degree being less able to get a job than a white guy coming out of jail. This is about my, his cousins, his brothers, and all of his relatives. This is a personal issue for me. So what do we need to do? First of all, we need to restructure CPED so that we focus on jobs. We need to say this is the crisis that it is, and we need to quit hiding this dirty little secret and pretending we're doing something about it. Secondly, we need to elevate the Office of Equity in the uh, Civil Rights Office. The woman doing the work in that office is doing phenomenal job, a phenomenal job on employment. We need to raise her up, we need to give her a cabinet level position, and we need to make equity an important issue, and everything needs to be viewed through the eyes of equity in our city. We need to focus on small businesses. We need to ensure that our small businesses have an opportunity and that everybody who's had a dream of doing a small business can start that small business because those small business are who hire people in our city. And then we need to look to our community. The community knows what to do. We don't need a blue ribbon commission. We need to talk to the community about what jobs they need, what jobs they want. We have people who are ready, willing, and able to work. We need to hook them up with the jobs that are available. Gary Schiff, how would you use city resources to address black unemployment and the elimination of poverty? The gap between those who have jobs and those who don't have jobs exists because of poverty and racism. And so that's a word I haven't heard used yet in the answer to this question. And I think we need leadership who will address it and will name it and will work to find a solution with the community standing behind and with every step of the way. And so, number one, we do have to start with the people who already provide jobs. The small business owners, the entrepreneurs, like Chef James at the Sunny Side, where I had my great breakfast this morning and where he endorsed me, because I'm supported by over 150 small business owners already in this campaign, because I have done the work of listening to small business owners and entrepreneurs, listen to the hurdles that they have day in and day out in dealing with a city bureaucracy that's out of control. Then we have to make sure that it's affordable to start a job in Minneapolis by not raising property taxes, to increase the gaps between people who can start jobs in the suburbs and people who can start jobs here in the city. Make sure that we maintain equal opportunity, level the playing field, so that every entrepreneur has the opportunity to succeed. And then number three, we have to connect our job training programs with the people who are hiring in our community with the thanks of tax dollars. Connect those programs because that is government dollars at work. We have to make sure the jobs go to people who live in the neighborhoods. You know, this is a, a great exercise. It's an important one. Uh, I'm pleased to be a part of it, pleased to work with the uh, church leadership to make this event, and I'm pleased that you all are here. This is what we have to do, and this is what we have to be known for in our community, and that is being known for civic engagement, involvement, being uh, uh, concerned at the table, negotiating our interests and determining a future that supports our community and therefore supports the country. It's a good thing. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank Alan McFarland for bringing us all those great words and all our lovely guests, all the guests in the house. Everything's good, you know. So I want y'all to tune in every Tuesday morning right around 9 o'clock. Because we're going to play us a song. All the guests will be home. We'll be feeling like talking. Have a roll. Bus conversation. Cause this thing is safe. The message is clear. Everybody knows we gotta give it life clear. We just going to talk about the McFarland show.